Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship here this morning at uh, St. Andrews. Uh, whether you're joining us in person or online, I hope you find that this is a time of refreshment, a time of strengthening, a time that can draw you closer to God. Joining us this morning will be uh, Rob Munro, obviously our neighbour from down the road in uh, Cheadle, but a very important person at the moment, because as from today at St Andrews and Emmanuel, we don't have a vicar, and Rob, as rural dean, is effectively the priest in charge of this parish, so you might say that as from today, he's my boss. Uh, but perhaps more importantly for us at St Andrews, he is patron. Now that's a bit of oddity of how the Church of England works, but it actually means that he'll be working with the representatives of the parish and a representative of the bishop to find a suitable candidate to replace uh, Christopher as uh, vicar uh, here. But today he'll be joining to help with the uh, worship. Uh, he has come or will be coming to preach. Uh, he'll be helping us look at Luke's gospel as we recommence our exploration that we uh, uh, finished at the beginning of Lent. Uh, he did warn me that he's likely to be late uh, because, of course, he's at Emmanuel uh, first. Uh, but if he doesn't turn up, I guess you'll be getting me impromptu, which you don't want. So um, as we come to worship uh, uh, God today, let's just turn to him in prayer. Almighty God, as we come together to meet, uh, to worship uh, the risen Jesus, we ask you to open our eyes so that we can see him more clearly. Open our ears so that we can hear your word and use these to strengthen us as his servants. We ask this in his name. Amen. As we come to God in worship this morning, Let's begin with a song, a song that praises God for who he is and pledges our dedication to him. Over all the earth you reign on high. Please stand to sing. Is that you bring? 
take a seat. And those who were fearing me having to ad lib on Luke's gospel, we're pleased to see that uh, Rob has joined us. So welcome, Rob. It's really good that you can uh, join us today. Uh, let's turn to God's word. Turning to the Old uh, Testament, uh, to page 558 in the Bibles, although it will be on the screen in front of us as well. And let's praise God for what he's done using the words of Psalm 30. Please join in with the even-numbered verses. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I, I said, I shall never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my raw mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I crawled. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. In the psalm, we heard David crying out, To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. And of course, we continue to need to do that because we fall short of being the people that God wants us to be. But Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Angela will now read to us uh, from... Uh, Luke chapter 18, after which I'd ask uh, Rob to guide us through the passage. The reading this morning is from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 14 which can be found on page 1051 in the Church Bibles. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. 
for some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Thanks very much for that. Let's um, pause and pray before we come to look at God's word together. God, our Father, we thank you that you are here with us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the truths of your word by which you shape our lives. And thank you for uh, your challenge to us to have faith in you and to listen and seek your will. Uh, So guide us now. May your word illuminate us and shape us and enable us to live for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's a great privilege to be with you in this first week of your vacancy as a parish and uh, to be given um, a brilliant passage to preach from, really, because if there's one thing that I would say is most necessary for every single one of you as you go forward in searching for your next incumbent, it is that you pray, um, and absolutely nothing of any substance or of blessing in the Church of Jesus Christ, the people he calls his own, happens without prayer. It's both the um, sign of our faith and it's the seed of our blessing. So in the providence of God... It's the tool by which he shapes the future and the single most important contribution that any of you will make to the future of this church. Um, But I probably need to make a confession at this point because actually I find prayer hard. I mean, I love to say I'm a prayer warrior up before dawn on my knees interceding for every single person I know in the life of the the parish and the deanery and the world or whatever, Um, but I don't. And In fact, even though I know and have experienced how absolutely crucial prayer is in the work of God and seen amazing answers to prayer, um, remarkable healings, people come to new faith, extraordinary providences of resources and of people, of God incidences in the workplace, I know and can testify to the extent that which anything that ever has happened in our parish has happened as the fruit of those who have undergirded it with prayer, despite all of that, I found actually getting myself organized to sit down on my own or with others for a concentrated, focused time of prayer is still one of the hardest parts of my Christian life. And if you find it easy, talk to me afterwards and help. Because in my experience, most Christians struggle with that. You know, to pray beyond just the immediate needs that we have of our own. So of all the truths of scripture, this one must be for us, as me as much as it is for you. The disciples, Jesus told the disciples a parable, verse 1, to show them that they should always pray and not give up. 
what's the secret of a successful prayer life? What we'll get is not only praying every day, but enjoying it. Well, there are two principles Jesus wants us to grasp in these two parables. And the first is simply that. To trust him enough to keep on asking. It is a weird parable, isn't it? Verses 2 to 5. There's a widow, somebody who had no rights or resources in those days, who wanted justice about something. And there's a judge that she goes to. He didn't care about God. He didn't care about people. He just cared about himself. And the parable seems to say, if you nag him enough, won't he just give you justice? Because even though it's the right thing to do, he didn't do it because it's right. He does it because he wants a quiet life for himself. So basically, if Jesus is saying, prayer is nagging God until he just gets fed up of us, and gives us what we want for a quiet life. It sounds like that, doesn't it? Well, actually, that's not what the parable is saying, uh, because as usual in parables, if you know them, the story makes one main point, and it makes it by way of a contrast. The point of the story is, if an unjust judge, who doesn't care about people or God, will give you the right thing, simply because you keep on asking and asking and asking, how much more will a just judge who actually loves you and has the power to do it, give you what you need. So in other words, the point is, will you trust him enough to not give up on asking? That's why, do you notice a weird punchline to the story in verse 14? Uh, verse 8, rather. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That thought, how does that fit? Well, of course it fits, because the issue at stake behind our prayer life is the reality of our faith. That's what Jesus is getting at. Why is it that we don't keep on praying for things? If we have access by faith to a sovereign God who loves us, why wouldn't we keep on bringing to him the needs that we have? And, and the parable implies there are two possibilities, really, that, uh, of why we'll give up. The first is simply that we don't really want what we're asking for. The point about the widow is she had nowhere else to go because she had no property, she had no income, no rights, no hope of justice, no social support. She just simply had a need and there was only one person who could answer that need. And the fact that he was unjust and the fact that he didn't care was irrelevant because simply she needed help. There was no one else. The point is, what you keep on praying for shows what really matters to you. Shows what you think you really need. Because if you really need it, you wouldn't give up asking for it. So why, why don't we see revival in Cheadle Hume yet? I mean, God could bring it. We've just been celebrating the fact he can raise the dead. So that's an easy thing compared to, you know, unless you think revival's harder than that. Well, one reason is possibly that we don't, corporately or individually, persistently, committedly and urgently seek God to do that. You know, in the histories of revivals or renewals, if you've ever read any of them, and I'd certainly commend them, they're quite a challenge. But, you know, like the Hebridean revival or the Welsh revival or the, you know, you pick the revival you will find as the histories are written up that the desire of God's people to actively, committedly, regularly and passionately pray for it has always seemed to be the thing that happened first. The move of the Holy Spirit to get God's people praying for revival seems to be the first step before he actually goes out and brings it. And it needn't be many. In fact, in the Hebrides, it was two women in their 80s who were the catalyst that God seemed to use. But how much do we really want that how much do you want it for St. Andrews? Enough to make the commitment to get together and keep praying for it. Enough to keep on praying over years, maybe. Because if we really want it, we won't stop asking. That's what Jesus is getting at. How much do we want what we ask for? Uh, but the second reason that I think that we... Um, tend to give up on keeping on asking and whether we trust Jesus enough to keep on asking is that actually in the end we doubt we doubt the one we're asking from because in the parable 
The widow doesn't give up, even on the unjust judge, because he alone had the power. We wouldn't go anywhere else. In a way, if you analyze why we often give up praying about something we need, we're implicitly saying something about our God. And we're either giving up on God's goodness because we're saying, well, we don't really believe that he cares enough about this situation to give us the answer we need. Or we're giving up on God's power because we're effectively saying, well, God, you know, I, you know we need this and, and you care, but actually you can't really deliver it. It's just too hard for you. So there's no point keeping on asking. But those are both questions of faith, aren't they? In the sense, doubting who we think God really is for us. And, and if we believe God can bring revival, it's no use asking him for it if we don't believe he has, hasn't got the power to do it or the will and desire for it. And the challenge Jesus has to his own day is that the one that comes to us as well, which is that we tend to treat prayer more like therapy than what it really is. You know, therapy, it's not so much as expecting God to really do the things we're asking for. It's just to get us to feel a bit better and sort of saying, well, okay, it's now it's over to you. I, I don't think you're really going to do this, Lord, but, um, you know, I'm, I've told you, tick, the box is done. You know, it's a, it's a good therapy to do. A bit like if you've got a headache, take a paracetamol, you know, that's it. Without asking what are we really wanting? <laughs> you know, what, what is the headache for? What, what's behind it all? Well, the fact is, if we treat prayer like that, it's not even faith, it's not even prayer, which is maybe why some of those prayers don't get answered so often. So it does seem to me this vacancy is an opportunity for us all, really, to test the reality of our faith and our estimation of what you really need. I mean, really need. Will we trust him enough to keep on asking him to bless this community or not? Is he good enough and powerful enough? Does it matter enough for us to keep on asking him? And only you will know whether that need is big enough for you to want to do that. But that's not all that Jesus has to say about prayer. Because the twin, there are twin dangers here. The twin danger of having a too lower opinion of God to bother praying. The twin danger is that we have too high an opinion of ourselves as we're praying. The first parable is about what we bring of God into our prayers, whether we have that faith or not. The second parable, though, is how we, br how we bring our prayer to God. So if you like, the second principle Jesus is getting at for our prayer life is simply this. Do we trust him for grace rather than for a reward? It's another weird parable. The two men that go up to the temple to pray. Um, in the 90s, um, a friend of mine used to um, work for a Romanian relief agency driving trucks of supplies from the UK to churches in orphanages in central Romania. And every time in those days, um, to get across the border, you would be held up by the guards and the guards would open up the truck and usually help themselves to something and let you pass. And it was sort of, it was what you did. You know, they would have a few things that they would set aside expecting to have them looted at the border with the hope of getting most of the supplies through. And this um, man told me, particularly on one occasion, after the usual border looting, he actually had to deliver the supplies only to a church that was relatively local. And so he stayed overnight and had been asked by the pastor there to give a message in the morning. And on that next day in the back of the church, he spotted one of the guards that the day before had looted the truck. And... Um, Apparently, and slightly disingenuously, rather pointedly in his message to the congregation, he talked a lot about corruption and injustice. And he was actually quite livid that this guy should have been there and cornered the minister to tell him, you know, you know, there is a guy, he shouldn't be in your church for what he's doing. He keeps looting the supplies for Christians. He's harming the work for the kingdom of God. And the minister turned to him and said, you're from England. You're a good Christian. You do everything right. This man comes to church because he knows he's doing everything wrong. I think God would rather have him here than you. Really? A bit offensive, isn't it? He's just driven away from the UK to, to bring supplies to the people in need, but 
that's what this parable is saying, that's how offensive it is to church-going Christians. Because let's face it, we're the Pharisees in the parable, aren't we? We're the ones who expect God's help, but don't really feel that we need it. Not that much anyway. See, the problem of being church people is that we assume God owes us favors in some way. And that cripples our praying because the assumption is we deserve God's favor. After all, we are better than many in our community, aren't we? It's terrible out there. There's family breakdown, dishonesty, drugs, alcohol, greed, immorality. We know that, but we're not like that here in church. I hope you're not anyway. Maybe I'll find out. But we're not like that, are we? We go to worship, we say our prayers, we support the food banks, we help other people, we actually believe in God. Surely we should be in the front of the queue of getting our prayers answered. And whether we consciously think that, unconsciously we probably do think that, don't we? That somehow we deserve more of our prayers answered than them, whoever they are. Praying for the future of this parish is not trying to persuade God that we deserve this. As if only if we get together and pray, we can twist God's arm enough to give us something we deserve. The Pharisee in the parable did more than he needed to in his prayers. You know, he fasted more and he gave more than was strictly necessary. That's why he felt so confident. He was going the extra mile already. But that wasn't what Jesus was saying is needed. Rather, we're to probably make this a season where we say we've failed. Lord, we've not got the resources, spiritual or personal, to make a difference. Have mercy, help us. We have nothing to bring but our need. That's what the gospel is about. It's about grace, an undeserved gift of God. That's the sort of faith that God seeks. Verse 13, the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man rather than the other went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So if deserving God's favor or thinking we deserve it, actually becomes a restriction to our praying. It's one of the reasons that it's hard to find the will of God. There is another shock in the parable because it also reveals that God's heart is to bless sinners more than to service saints. You see, if we don't get what we want, we basically assume, because we thought we deserved God's favour, that when we don't see the answer to our prayers, we assume we're being denied God's favor. You know, God must have it in for us. There must be something wrong. I mean, tax collectors with the scum, the lowest of the low, collaborators with enemy occupation, exploiters of their power, extortioners of money from an already impoverished people. The point was, in Jesus' audience, they not only assumed that the Pharisees deserved their prayers to be answered, they also passionately assumed that people like tax collectors definitely should not get their prayers answered. They did not deserve it. How can God bless sinners? Of course, by sinners, we all always define sinners as, you know, the people worse than we are. Because we don't, we'll just use the word in services, we don't really think we are. Who deserves a brilliant new minister for this parish? This parable is saying you don't. You don't deserve it. They do. The lost thousands of people around you who without Jesus Christ are condemned to hell. That's the heart Jesus has for this place. It's not what will suit you best that matters. What's on Jesus' side is, what about the rest? God is more likely to bless what they pray for, even though they're not even sure if they're praying to somebody, than he will to us in a way, especially if we think we deserve it. 
Because the gospel he's given us is one of an undeserved love, of a grace and sacrifice that comes not because we've tried hard, because we work hard, but actually because God loves beyond all the boundaries that we put in the way. I don't know how you pray for Cheetle Have you even prayed for Cheetle Hume like that before? Why not? Is it partly because we see the problems we have here? They're pretty big in different ways. Too big to get on to other people. Praying to a saviour who spent most of his time with the other people and not with the people in the temple. And not only do we think they don't deserve to have their prayers answered, we often make it conditional and, you know, they've got to do Christianity Explored first or get confirmed or join a group or a home group or come to church at least regularly. And actually, there are some even here probably who probably don't pray for others because you don't feel like you deserve to be here yourself because you've got a sense of feeling maybe a secret sin or failure or some weakness in your life. You feel like actually you're barely clinging on to your faith as it is. You see, behind this parable is the gospel, a message of grace. Jesus calls us to come to him in humility, not in our self-confidence, not because we expect we deserve it, but because we don't deserve it and know it, and because we know his heart is always for the people that are lost, and we know that we're lost without him. None of us, even the most holy person here, deserves the blessing of God. As Isaiah once put it, your righteousness is like filthy rags. The best of what we do is so sufficiently flawed that apart from the grace of God, it's worthless. But the gospel is that God's grace is sufficient for our weakness if we're ready to receive it. When we know we need it enough to persist praying for it. It's actually why, bizarrely, Anglican services are right to keep confessions in them when Often the more trendy churches don't want to make you feel bad because we are never less than sinners needing grace. But sometimes we need to feel it a bit more than the self-righteousness that comes through being in the building. In other words, the gospel should make us like young kids at Christmas. You know what they're like. They just love it. They're not trying to deserve what they get. Not unless you bash them with the sort of Santa story of uh, he's going to have a go at you if you're not good enough. But they don't. They don't. They just love it. They open it. They know they don't deserve it. They're not going to try and repay it, are they? They just want to enjoy it. Christmas Day is a joy because the gifts come from the grace of love, not as a reward. And adults are stressed by it because if your present doesn't match the one that somebody else has bought for you or or they send you a card and you haven't sent a card and we're worried about deserving it. Children don't. Children understand grace. And Jesus wants us to be children of God. Not adults deserving God. And I think that's God's challenge for us all as we face a vacancy. I have a role to play, so do you. To begin to see and pray into the need of this community, of the men and women whose lives are lost without knowing that love of God, the grace of Jesus' salvation, and the community that the Holy Spirit enables. We don't deserve God to do something simply because we pray. That's, but assuming that we see the need as he sees it, and don't blind ourselves with our own little agendas, Assuming we see how significant it is and how lost people are without him. Assuming you see how lost we are without just this gift of grace that we don't deserve and can never repay. Unless the gospel takes root in our hearts. Unless we persist in that praying, we won't see the the joy that comes from seeing the gospel change us. Prayer is the power that changes everything because it is the way we express our faith. It is the way that we show and share the agenda that God has. But Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And until we're ready to be lost, we're more pharisaical than whatever the descriptive term for tax collectory is. So as you start in this vacancy, let me encourage you and me to wait on God together, to ask what he wants to do with us.
not for us, but with us, for the people that are on his heart, to trust him enough to keep on asking, to be humble enough to keep receiving. And in these next months, if we do that, they could be the most significant that this parish has ever seen. Not because of what we are doing, but because of who he is. As Jesus says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as ever your word challenges right to the core of who we are and how we see ourselves. And Lord, we confess the shock that these parables were to those you first shared them with is just as much to us who are more inclined to be Pharisees than we are faithful, who are more inclined to give up than we are to persist. But we know that we need you. We know that this community needs you. We know that your heart is to seek and save the lost. So we ask by your spirit that you will give us that heart, that you'll give us a sense of the need so deep that we won't give up on praying for it, a sense of our own unworthiness so much that we won't give up rejoicing in the gift of your grace. And Lord, may it be your pleasure, though we don't deserve it, to enable us to more effectively do what you've called us to do and call to this place a minister who will help us and encourage us, but one that will enable us to be this people. Saved by grace, living by faith, sharing the good news. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you for that challenge, Rob. One of the reasons that Rob was suggesting that our prayer life might not be as effective as we might hope it would be is that we don't trust enough. To help us trust, let's remind ourselves of who is this God we believe in, this God we've come to worship today. I invite you to stand and declare what it is we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we remain standing, let's sing to remind ourselves of those truths we've just declared as we sing how deep the Father's love for us. Yes. 
Rob's already hinted at some of the uh, processes that need to take place as we seek a new vicar for this parish. But as he's joining us here today, I thought it might be helpful if he spent a moment or two just explaining what his role is, what our role is in the uh, processes that need to be followed. Um, yeah, really just for your information and your prayers, um, there is a crucial meeting this Wednesday of the PCC um, uh, at which the process uh, slightly more formally begins. Um, the appointment of a new minister is a sort of a three-legged stool affair um, between uh, a parish who will elect two representatives to um, represent you, <laughs> that's a good title I suppose, um, and uh, the bishop uh, and the patron and the patron is really, uh, and that's me in this case, uh, is the advocate of the parish, um, uh, on, well, on your behalf, in relation to the diocese. That's sort of how it works. Um, but on the actual day of an induction, uh, I present a new minister for your reception. Um, and the process is the um, patron presents a, a parish interview and accepts and uh, a bishop ratifies in that process but that means that the meeting on Wednesday uh, the representatives of the parish are um, absolutely front and centre in deciding what those priorities are um, you will produce a thing called a parish profile which I think some of you already fed in things into um, which is the crucial document because neither the patron nor the bishop can make decisions that contradict it um, so getting that right is an important part um, other decisions about whether we advertise or things like that, will um, I'll be talking through with the PCC so that they can make those decisions. On the whole, I usually recommend that we do, but just because it helps put, um, put information out there. In my experience, in fact, mostly people um, who uh, get called to a place tend to hear about it not just because it's been publicised, but through other people who can then point to the fact it's been publicised as a way of um, doing it. So as you pray, you know, be a part of that process. If there are people that you know or people that you know of that you know or, you know, um, that you think, well, actually, there is a person who seems to be a really good fit for our parish, then um, make them aware of it and uh, point them to adverts and help them to um, take a part. Um, but above all, in the process, we pray. When we finally get to... Um, uh, uh, applications that are put in um, things are shortlisted I tend to prefer to um, encourage people to do what I call a reflective process rather than a competitive one in the sense of saying well let's have a, a look in the round at somebody and sort of test them out a bit and get to know them a bit rather than just see can you perform well in an hour-long interview um, but some of those questions we will be talking about with the PCC on Wednesday um, uh, in terms of time scale which I know some of you'll be bothered about um, we're in the hands slightly of others. The key thing is to make sure that as a parish you are behind what you're asking for in the profile, which is the PCC's job. Um, uh, my hope would be that um, this process will be able to deliver something um, for the summer or for the early autumn, um, and that would be reasonable in the time scale. The quickest I've ever managed it as a patron is two months, um, but uh, I do tend to work on the quicker side than the slower side. But you are dependent on the bishops in their timing. But I think they're fairly, they want to be as positive as we can. Um, and otherwise, the most, and seriously, I wasn't, it wasn't just a, because the passage was saying it, you know, it is actually our prayers that are the most crucial part of this process. So, you know, seek God and um, trust that he will bring to us what um, will 
help this parish reach its community the most effectively and fulfill our calling. Is that a... I mean, if there are any questions, I'm quite happy to take questions, if you like. We can do interactive. I'm still here. If uh, any would like to know anything. Or, or you can call me over at the end. Um, okay. Try it, Peter? No, brilliant. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I realise that was information that people on the PCC knew already, because Rob has spoken to us, but I thought it was important that everyone had a chance to know where we are, where we're going, and would reiterate uh, Rob's uh, plea that you would pray for those who are taking the decision forward, particularly for the PCC this Wednesday, and also pray for those who might be looking at this parish and asking whether this is where God is calling them to serve. But this evening, evening prayer will be still on Zoom, despite what we did last week. We're not meeting in person for, uh, uh, for uh, that yet. Uh, that'll be at 6.30. Next Sunday, in addition to the normal services, uh, we've got a caster service, a service for young people at 9.30. And the intention is that that's a short service to allow the uh, young people who've been coming, particularly to the Friday, but also to uh, the parents and very young people who've been coming on the Thursday midweek sessions to uh, come and experience something of what worship in a church is like. It would be good if people could come and support that as well. And not really by way of bribery, but uh, for people who uh, turn up uh, for the 9.30 caster service uh, and want to stay for communion at 11. There will be a bit of a gap, so we'll supply refreshments to fill that gap. Uh, so uh, please consider that uh, uh, whether or not you can help support these children and uh, their families who we hope will be coming to that uh, service. Uh, finally, we're working towards Festival Manchester and I think Roger wants to say a little bit about what we need to do to prepare for that. Morning. Um, I think people I hope have, have been hearing a little bit about Festival Manchester over recent months um, but today marks uh, if you like a, a two month time period before the actual event takes place. Um, I hope you'll be aware that uh, it's something that's really been organised through the message. Um, it's in uh, Withenshaw Park on the weekend of the 1st of July um, and it's a, um, an event that's really designed predominantly not just for families but, but for young people but also for everyone to have a good time, enjoy it, but, but to hear the gospel. Uh, and then now, over the next few weeks, are going to be a number of events that really is an opportunity for us uh, to also be active with. Um, there's a, a fellowship, friendship, training day, and they're going to be various venues. Um, the most likely, or the, the nearest venue, is actually Poynton Baptist Church on the 16th of May. Um, so that's one thing. Also, because it's, it's a huge undertaking, they need volunteers. So on the actual weekend, they need people to do all sorts of things. Some of those things could be very simple, maybe just uh, telling people where to go, maybe, I don't know, organising uh, car parking, etc. So that's something else for us to consider. And then more particularly, there's a prayer. We've just been hearing so much about prayer and the importance of prayer. Uh, but there's a prayer of vision evening on the 10th of May uh, at 7 o'clock at the message. Um, now, there's been things in Newsline, and I make sure that it goes in Newsline uh, over the next few weeks. But please, again, be praying so much for this important event. It, it's for the whole of Greater Manchester, but clearly, from our point of view, it, it's something that, that really we can support locally. Uh, and I know Fiona and the young people are hoping to, to get involved in attending. So just to mention that again, and, and you'll probably get fed up with us keep telling you and drip feeding, 
but it is so important that we, we do support this in, in whatever way we can. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. And now it is appropriate that we as a church move towards a time of prayer. I'll start with the collect for today, after which Margaret will continue our prayers of intercession. Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us also to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's pray. As we come to pray, let's just pause for a minute or two to consider who we are praying to and just who God is. Our banner reminds us that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, who was and is and is to come the Almighty. And so we can say with the psalmist, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him. Our Father God, we thank you that you do care for us and you love us and that you loved us enough to send your son to suffer and die for us and to rise again so that we can know your loving presence here with us today and every day. In this Jubilee year, we thank you for our Queen, for her years of service, and especially for her example of faith in you and her willingness to share that. May she be kept in good health so that she can enjoy her Jubilee celebrations. And we pray for the troubled world. We thank you that in all the turmoil around us, we can enjoy the beauty of springtime. We thank you for the colour and new life we see abounding around us. But we pray for your compassion and mercy on those caught up in war and conflict, for those enduring civil war and terrorist insurgency. We especially pray for people in Ukraine and Russia who are grieving for loved ones who have died in conflict. And we pray that they will find your peace. And we pray, Father, that in all these places, there will be a desire for peace and a willingness to negotiate settlements. We ask for your blessing on all those who have had to leave their homes and perhaps family members, that they may find food and shelter and also acceptance and friendship. And we think, too, of those suffering with drought and famine and pray for rain and good harvest so that their suffering is alleviated. And may the agencies helping them have the stamina and the patience to persevere in their work. And we pray for our country today, Lord. And as we uh, come to local elections this week, we pray for local le leaders and national leaders who will have moral integrity and will rule in righteousness and justice and fairness for the good of all. We pray, Father, as the cost of living rises, we pray for those families struggling to make ends meet. Grant them hope rather than despair, and may they find the right help and support to meet their needs. We pray, too, for the many people still suffering because of the pandemic and the effect of the lockdowns, those who have long COVID, those who have experienced mental unrest or social problems. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Our missionary focus today is the Hooker family. Josh, Kathy, Benjamin, their children, Benjamin, Erin and Matthew. They have spent 16 years serving the Lord in Africa 
and have recently returned to Northern Ireland. So let's pray for them. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Josh and Kathy's willingness to leave their home and families to work for you for so many years. Bless them as they adjust to life in Northern Ireland. And especially we pray for Benjamin, Erin and Matthew. Help them to become used to their different way of life, different schooling, and help them to make new friends. We pray that you will give Josh and Kathy inspiration and energy as they teach the Bible in the local church and equip preachers to preach. In your name we pray. Amen. And we pray for ourselves. As we begin our interregnum, we pray for those responsible for selecting a new vicar. We pray for wisdom, discernment and clear guidance from you. Help us to encourage and support them. May we all have the humility and grace to let go of our own personal agendas and to commit prayerfully to seek your will. O oh Lord, we pray for a renewal of your Holy Spirit among us. We pray these prayers in your name and for your glory. Amen. So let's join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we come towards the end of this time of worship, we close with a statement of intent. A statement that as we go out into the world, we will continue to proclaim what God has done for us and for that world through Jesus. Please stand to sing, tell out my soul the great
as we remain standing, let's pray for one another using the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.